Good afternoon and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock. So glad that you decided to be here to join us for delivering hope and rebuilding dignity of the refugees in Greece. You have made now four trips, is that right? Four trips to Greece. And uh, in addition to hearing about their visits um, for, for that, um, for the refugee crisis that's there, one of the uh, things we had an opportunity to do as a congregation is to give a large grant to the UNICEF for a project, and uh, it was a project that the Woodhouse uh, contingency had a chance to visit. So we are going to hear about the, how that money has made a difference in the lives of those who were um, in that part of Greece. So I'm going to turn the program over to Wild Harmonica Player, in addition to being a um, humanitarian, um, Colin Woodhouse, and he will introduce his clan and uh, tell us a little bit more about the most recent visit and share with us a video that uh, uh, film director Artemis Joukowsky, some of you remember, may remember from de uh, Defying the Nazis, uh, produced about this work. So I believe you, you have active microphones there, and um, I'll just turn this light off, and you can take it away. Okay. Glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Ned White, Minister of uh, Shelter Rock, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Shelter Rock. Uh, my name is Colin Woodhouse, and I'm pleased to kick off our presentation today. Um, I want to thank the people who've attended today, and I also want to thank very much our, our family for taking this cause on and committing to it over the last two years. And the longer you go into working with people, or the longer you work with people who need help, the greater your commitment the greater your understanding, the greater your, your humanity. Um, so uh, with us today, I'd like to introduce my family, uh, most of whom went to Greece with us at one time or another to provide service and humanitarian aid. We have uh, certainly my wife, Latifa, who will be um, basically helping us with the presentation and giving you a sense of the personal stories there in Greece, given that she's fluent in Pashto and Farsi and also knows Arabic and Urdu. So uh, Latifa was our key uh, bonder, communicator, and storyteller. And in a sense, she has taken the burden on of the stories of the people that we've met and has committed to carry those stories forward. Uh, with, in the center here is our daughter, Sophia. And Sophia went with us on our last trip. And uh, I, will be, I, I want her to give a sense of what she saw. Because in many ways, uh, the issue, the, the uh, situation has evolved over the last two years that we've been working in Greece. I want to ask Alexandra to come up. She was there at the very beginning. Come on, Alex. Uh, she was at the beginning when it was all about rescue, recovery, emergency aid, getting people off the beach, getting people warm clothes, warm tea, uh, combating hypothermia, and getting them into a camp that we were part of that provided 24-7 aid and rescue services. At that time, we also brought on our team, uh, a pediatrician. So it was all about saving lives, uh, securing people, and then moving them onward. At that time, the, uh, the situation was fluid, and people were piling in by the hundreds, the thousands, any given week, and over overwhelming the uh, island of Lesbos, and we were part of a volunteer cadre that, in a sense, made up for the lack of preparation which is understandable for the large, uh, the large service groups such as the High Commissioner for Refugees and the International Rescue Committee. They were simply overwhelmed. And so without volunteers such as what we are and the people that we met, many, many more lives would have been lost and much more suffering would have occurred. And I also want to introduce my daughter, Jessica. Come on up, Jesse. Come on up. <laughs> And Jessie is our attorney daughter. She has yet to go with us, but her, her, um, 
her skills will be definitely needed and that uh, one of the main issues for refugees now is the lack of human rights. And frankly, the EU, the European Union, is actively pushing back refugees back to places of danger from which they came, and which is a real violation of the rights of uh, migrants and, and uh, the rights of those seeking asylum. But those rights are basically thrown out the window and abused, and the EU, its various states, has said no more, and we're going to pay uh, countries to enforce their borders or shut down the flow of humanity. And um, regardless, if you will, of the brutality of that particular policy. And so actually there are people being sent back to places of danger, which is a terrible violation, and it, it can be murderous in its worst consequences. And then I also want to thank members of our um, charity. We set up a charity called Shared Humanity uh, because we wanted to give people who wanted to donate the opportunity to have a tax-free contribution, and we want to build uh, knowledge and understanding of the, the issues of refugees, and we believe that it's an issue, frankly, that will not dissipate in our lifetime, the lifetime of our children and their children. It is a major, major movement of humanity. I wouldn't even call it a crisis. I'd call it the press of humanity. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. We were fortunate to go to UNICEF and get a wonderful briefing from their country director. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the systems that are occurring. And we also have a guest with us, um, Emma, who uh, really linked us up with uh, UNICEF and really provided a lot of guidance and made things happen. So thank you very much. Um, so, uh, what we're going to do, uh, I'm, we're going to, I'll just set up our program. We're going to have a, a movie, which is a, a, a short eight minute move, movie that was uh, created by um, uh, Artemis Joukowsky, who his last major film was a PBS uh, national documentary on the Sharps War two who dared to defy the Nazis. And those, those two people harken back to the origination of our UU, Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, which is our human rights organization. And the service committee uh, was founded by these, this minister and his wife who went into Czechoslovakia right during uh, the, the beginning of World War II and extracted out at great risk to themselves and to their family over 2,500 activists, Jewish families, children. And because of that work, they were awarded Righteous Among Nations by the state of Israel. Only two of three Americans to be so honored. And Artemis did a film on uh, the history of his grandparents, which was essentially buried in their basement. They never talked about it. They never told anything about it. He had a project to do as, as an eighth grader, and the project was find somebody who has moral courage. And um, his mother said, why don't you talk to your grandmother? I think she did something in World War II. And uh, he did, and he went down into the cellar and found thousands of documents. And many of those documents rep represent the lives of people that their family saved. So Artemis uh, said, I want to have a movie about what's going on now in uh, the second greatest refugee crisis, migrant crisis since World War II when his grandparents were operating. And so we brought a filmmaker and you're gonna see the, the result of that film. It's a work in progress and it'll, we're gonna constantly tweet it, but uh, I hope you like it. And then um, I, I, you know, I'd like to introduce my wife Latifa, who's really been the uh, organizer on site and the people who, who, the person who's made this effort really human and uh, really wonderful. So thank you, Latifa. Enjoy. Well, thank you, Colin, for this uh, great introduction of what I have done. But what I would like to do is I would like to welcome you all this afternoon to um, this uh, wonderful occasion of 
bringing information firsthand to all of you from Greece, Lesbos, Greece, the Aegean Sea, how the people have been drowned and lost their lives, and some of them have made it. Um, what I would like to do is, because of our four trips, as Colin mentioned, we have now found a um, nonprofit called Shared Humanity. As you could see, all of our T-shirts says Share Humanity. And that Share Humanity um, has a mission. And I would like to invite Sophia Woodhouse to tell you what the mission of Share Humanity is before we start the film. All right. Nothing like being put on the spot. <laughs> you can do it. So our um, involvement with the refugee crisis started about three years ago. Um, fast forward to January of this year, we formally created a nonprofit organization called Shared Humanity. And the mission of this organization really is to rebuild the dignity of people ha that have been forcibly displaced by war, violence, and oppression. And the reason why rebuilding dignity is so very important is that when these people leave their homes and they cross that border, not only are they leaving behind their possessions, their family members, they are also leaving behind everything that makes them who they are. They're leaving behind the fact that they are a mother, a daughter, that they are a doctor or a chemist, and they are becoming a refugee. And that is really, really hard for these people that are starting anew. Um, they are in a place where all they want is to work, to be part of society, to break this chain of dependency, and it's really, really difficult. And so it's really important for us as an organization to partner with the organizations that are on the ground that are doing just that. They are rebuilding people's dignity, dignity. They are rebuilding their identities, giving them a sense of purpose, and allowing them to be the people that they once were. Um, so that is the mission of Shared Humanity. Um, we're very excited to have you guys here to share a little bit about what I had an opportunity to see firsthand, as well as the work that we've done to date. Um, and that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Sophia, for that introduction of Share Humanity. Now, um, I am blessed and grateful to not only my children, my husband, who are with me shoulder to shoulder in this uh, work of justice, but also to our congregation, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Shelter Rock, for the work they are doing, not only in the United States of America, where they have touched everybody's lives by the wonderful grants uh, through the VEACH program and also through our large uh, grant program. What has happened in this congregation for the past three years, the congregation has continued to give grants through large grants to the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee to SAM, which is Syrian medical um, staff at uh, the border of Yemen and uh, Syria. And also, last year, of course, through the enthusiasm of my two daughters, Sophia and Alexandra, uh, the congregation was very kind and enough to give a large grant of $100,000 to UNICEF. And boy, UNICEF, thank you for how they put that money into works firsthand. The three of us, Colin, Sophia, and I, that we were at on that trip just in April, saw the results of the money that Shelter Rock has given through large grants to UNICEF. And UNICEF done a magnificent job with that $100,000 and built five blue dot centers, which that means, you will see it in the film, the picture, but what it means is they have provided these refugees that are like you and I, and they have lost everything, with a beautiful space for education, daycare, for the space for women, where they could cook, they could do embroidery, and they could get together and share their stories. So that comfort for these refugees who are living right now in Camp Moria, which is 
the worse than any prison you have ever seen, and it has the capacity of 2,000 people, and they put seven to 8,000 people on any given week. Those people then walk, and UNICEF has made it so convenient that they could even walk to the center where they, we were there a day after they had the blue ribbon, uh, the blue ribbon cutting ceremony, and they showed us with $35,000 of the Shelter Rock money, they had built this magnificent center. And Lucio, who was the officer in Athens of UNICEF, told us that they have four more of these centers that they have built with a large grant. So folks, I call on you to please always support the large grant, but also support UNICEF, UUSC, and all these wonderful humanitarian organizations that are doing a fabulous work out there in the international world. So congratulations, Shelter Rock, for such a great, great grant to help humanity. Thank you. Okay. So let's do the movie. Now we're going to show the movie. Yeah, go ahead. You're in charge of it. Yes, why don't we show the movie now, please? Thank you. All-time high of 60 million refugees. Worst refugee crisis since the Second World War. These aren't people. These are animals. And we're taking them out of the country at a level and at a rate that's never happened before. These are the refugees of war, of devastation. People are on the move to either die in the Aegean Sea or make it to Europe, make it to America. How could dead babies be floating ashore? How could this happen in this day and age? My father tell me, Zahra, you, you, you have life now. It's okay, you can, you are free now. And the light will go on. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel. There's a pushback everywhere in Greece now. Uh, people are tired of it. They lost their uh, tourist season. They lost uh, huge amounts of revenue. They're inundated with people. The people on the islands are angry because the Greek government won't let refugees off the island. So the whole island has become an incarceration camp. It was not a conversation, it was more of a conviction, being part of this now journey that we've been on for the past two years. What could a couple of people do? We didn't realize how serious this situation was. Our entire family got together and we really, we worked together. We're gonna go to Greece, how do we do that? We've been able to go to Greece three times in the last 18 months. We're gonna go back again. We're gonna help build a sustainable worker cooperative in Athens where people can work, they can earn money, they can recover their dignity and their self-respect, and they can prepare themselves for eventual settlement. My husband and I and my adult children have dealt with thousands of refugees. We bought rice, oil, beans, tomato sauce, and brought them, you know, for 2,000 people. I feel the responsibility to go to Greece and to take an active part in helping with this refugee crisis. Around half a million Syrians escaping from the war decided because not having the condition of surviving in neighboring countries, just to cross the Aegean Sea, enter Greece, and to these half a million of Syrians, many other nationalities, Afghan, mm -hmm. Iraqi, Pakistani, and many other nationalities started following this human river. More than one million people 
entering mainly through Greece. Migration is part of the human being DNA. When I see the boat and the sea, a lot of water, I feel so bad. Why we are here? Why we are not in Syria? It's really bad for me and my father say I cannot stay in Syria. Syria now so bad for me, for my daughters, for, for all my family. When we are asleep, when so tired because so long, uh, the man, hey, wake up, wake up, now we have to go in the night. During the night, when we have a problem, who can help? Who can help us? And he said, this is not my problem. I, I will make the boat and you, you can go. And my father say, my mother, uh, please, uh, guys, it's okay, be relaxed. SIM card for all the world. I, I buy one in Turkey yeah. and I put it in my phone and I uh, and then I call uh, Greek people and the Greek people answer and I'm so so happy because they come this day we are in the Greek the dark boat the dark Syrian life the dark Turkish life but Look at the light that you came. Because you're determined, you're strong. 65 million people that are on the move today. How do we mobilize this world for love and for all? I come from a long line of clerics and uh, imams in Afghanistan. We always greet our friends and our acquaintance with peace be upon you and peace is accepted. The unfortunate thing is that Afghanistan has not seen peace for the past 40 years. Who would have thought that the Russian would come and take over our country? And my father, who's the mayor, would lose everything just like your father mm. and my father would become a refugee. Mm. But when he became a refugee, he wanted me back. When he was the mayor, he said, forget it, I'm mm -hmm. done with you. Mm -hmm. You married somebody from a different religion, different countries, we are done. And if your uncle finds out, they will kill me mm. and him and everybody else. So you went through that trauma and yeah. I, can, I can understand your pain, I know. What made you leave Afghanistan and made yourself a refugee? So many things changed in my life. I was 18 years old when I got married. One day she told me that my family, my father is going to give me to someone else which is older than me, 15 years. They just sold their daughter to an old person. But when she was my girlfriend, she says, Tamim, if you would like to save me, it's good. If you don't, I will kill myself. Then I got her married, but always the, her brother, always her brother was calling me, harassing me to, to find me or kill me. Right. But we just had a normal life, slowly, slowly, and we made two kids. My wife families, they are so crazy, they are so bad, they are trying to kill me or to kill my wife. Sure. Your son was stolen by her brothers. Yeah, they was always trying to attack me, and to kill me, and one of our day they find the opportunity and they, they kidnap my son. If I go to them, they will leave my son camp. If I not, they will kill him. Mm -hmm. This is very, very hard for any father or mother to lose a son. Hello, we are kidnapping your son. We need you. We don't have a problem with your son. If you would like to save him, come to me. I will leave your son to go. Well, it was too late because when they call us the second time, they says you have only half an hour time. If you would like to come, tell me. If you not, you will kill your son. So after half an hour, they, we just receive a call from them. They says you are too late. You don't like your son. You don't love him. You can find his dead body outside of your house. Then when we go outside, we just find him in a in a plastic box, and they was just pushing his neck. And he was done. And you and your wife and your father were all at home. I'm sorry. We was at home.
when they brought the bags, he was at home. And How just, old was your son? Three years old, almost three. Three years old. And those cruel, terrible people slaughter your son and put it in a box and brought it to you. In the past, we entered in contact with a lot of minors being on the street, and most of them being like 14, 15, and just came to Europe looking for something good. A crisis is like something that came and like you have to act to it. Like this is not a crisis, this is 10 years of this. Yeah. This is too much. It's just gonna get worse because more people are coming and there is not enough help. Europe is not being a great country to come to. The major problem is Europe, open your doors. America, open your doors. Get involved and don't forget about the refugees. Italy is also a country that has been really affected by the refugee crisis. So like Italy, you have to go to the south of Italy and then try to enter in a camp, it's very hard. Greece make it very accessible for anyone who wants to come and help. People crash ashore in Lesbos, Greece, in the islands. They walk miles to get here. And you're probably, oftentimes, the first people they meet. And with very little resources, you do what you can because you care. I cannot do most of the things that people actually need. I cannot give asylum to someone. I cannot make shorter the time to wait travel documents. Yeah, they need to have food, but they need to have their rights, and I cannot give that. You are here, far away from your family, far away from your country, far away from your language, far away from anything you have and any possibility you basically had. That means something happened to you. No one does this because they're happy in their country. At the beginning, um, you will find most people here had uh, a success story in their own countries, but suddenly the wind changed. Because of the political situation in Egypt, I had to leave the country. It's not uh, my, uh, my own decision, but I was forced to. I had a good success story in, in Egypt, but suddenly everything changed and I had to leave. It's, it started long time ago with the fake democracy. We are a republic and we're supposed to be a democratic country, but we are not. The revolution in Egypt in 2011 was not a revolution against Mubarak. Deep inside, in the background, it was a revolution of the people against the military. It was a big demonstration because of the elections. The results was faked and cancelled and a lot of people were detained and forced to resign. So we were demonstrating and protesting against this, but they so you were caught to, as a political uh, yes. demonstrator and you were put in prison. They came to my house, they took everything, took my documents, papers, everything. So for the first time in history after the French Revolution, right. more than 200 people at the same court session are um, facing death penalties in, in one session. For, for one crime and mm. you know this is not right and this is not just yeah.
I came to Lesbos because the Lesbos on that time it was the most uh, busy island with most uh, boats coming to Lesbos. Most of the refugees are Muslims, which means they eat halal meat. And on that time, a lot of locals here was not accepting them on them restaurants, on them coffee bars. Came to the point to make the only one Middle East restaurant in this island. On some point, I find out that my restaurant was not just a restaurant. It was so many other things than a restaurant. They have to stay somewhere, they have to eat somewhere, they have to do something. At most, we were not charging anything. Europe is looking after them, but how and what they are doing? Just making this island a prison for the refugees? Because actually right now, this island it is like a prison for refugees. In your country, you have a lot of ideas. You are a father, you are a worker, you are an expert on that, that, and that. Wherever you cross your country, you are a refugee. There are people that they have a lot of identities in the country that they lost them. Wherever they, they pass, they lost them. We are speaking about children, we are speaking about families. We are not speaking about beneficiaries. These are people just like us. And it's very easy to be in their shoes. It's very easy. We're all human, we're all in this together. Today it's happening to Syrian, Afghan, and Iraqi. Tomorrow it could happen to the Greeks, to Americans, to anybody. Every day we have uh, more than 50 people that are coming. There were last week, uh, uh, one day they came uh, about 300 people. Very difficult because people, they, they told them lies. The smugglers, they told you that without money you will have food. You will have people that they will watch you. You will have uh, medical care. You will have uh, uh, psychology, clothes, a, a ticket to go to Germany or wherever. Some of them, they told them that here is Germany. But these refugees are still with a hope. They paid a lot of money to smugglers to smuggle their son or their daughter. And those son and daughters have no future because they don't have the right papers. They don't have insurance. So when they get sick and they don't have papers to go to school. There are people that are coming here that they don't know what is Europe, which are the countries. They don't know the boundaries. They don't know anything. They believe the smugglers because they have the need to believe them. This is very important. They still hope. I feel, I feel happy when I stay here. When, uh, I want to continue my study. I want to be a journalist. I want to show all the world what happened in Syria, what happened in Iraq, what happened in the Iran, what happened in the Afghanistan, in the Pakistan. We are so happy, we are so glad because we have a lot of friends from the other country. When I, when I am here, I see my father is good, my family is good, I am good. From what you've been through and how you didn't have homes and how those police could have taken you for granted, I just <laughs> love you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarita. Thank you. It's so Thank wonderful. You. Thank you Thank so you. much for what you do. You are the future of yeah. our world. Refugees need life, new life. They want to merge with the societies. And this will be by education, this will be by giving them some skills to be able to support themselves. This is my idea and this is my dream to, to make the refugees not a problem. I know that refugees are a problem for any country. Sure. This is obvious. If we look behind the scene, this is called the manpower. Right. We have a big um, resource uh, of, of of power. I, 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 I don't submit. I started again and I will build my new life. I will not stop. Life, sure. is, life doesn't stop and I will not stop. Tell me how is life here and what are you doing presently and what are your hopes for tomorrow, for the future? I, I see it like a big beautiful red flower from the rubbish. 
resilience to go forward. Yes. And that earth flower is going to grow and grow and grow sure. and spread all over. Terrible people, they was always following me to kill me. They, so many times they came and they put bomb in our house. Our house was like very bad condition. They shoot my brother three bullets. They did so many things. If I explain it at all, it will take two hours. Since you have stolen their woman from the tribe of Tajik and you're Uzbek, that is, was a cultural tradition that if you steal a woman, you are going to be either killed and in this case, since you didn't attend, they took your three-year-old son and, and killed him. So that is the cruelty of humankind and those are practices in Afghanistan and I hope they have put an end to that. So you married for true love and you saved, um, you know, Zarina from her father marrying her to a 75-year-old man. But here you're still paying the price. So you left your beloved country, Afghanistan, to come as a refugee to Greece. My son, what do you want to become in the future? He will tell that I want to become a doctor. So I want to, I, I hope they're going to be like a very educated people in the society to help the people around the world to be, have a like very important person in the world for the people around everywhere. So I hope a good future for them. Congratulations, by the way, you have been now a Greek citizen. You have mm. your papers, you have your passport. Mm. Uh, is your hope to stay here and continue your life and educate your children here, or do you still have a desire to go to other countries? And if you do so, which country would that be? And that it's, to me, uh, it's a, a massive flow of humanity that will not end. We have to stop the cause of the, of, uh, that's causing this huge flow of people to countries that have amazing resources, have amazing wealth, and have captured that wealth and will not share it. Protected by our oceans, but people are still coming up through uh, Latin America, through Central America, into our country, and we're shutting our doors. We're, we're building a big wall. People like you and me are considered less human. And and that's a danger not only to those people, but to us as human beings. And in our lifetime, it's probably going to be, uh, we'll be doing this for the rest of our lives. How can you turn away now when you see this? We try to offer to every people uh, the right uh, to a bath or uh, to wash uh, their uh, clothes. It's uh, very important for them to take their life back. So we try to find uh, a place, a safe place to sleep. Greek or refugees or immigrants. It's open for everyone, all the people. I want to also say thank you for the good work. The houses I've seen, what you have given them is wonderful. But what you can give to make the process a little quicker would be a wonderful thing. The progress is tremendous, but there's still thousands of people who don't have houses. We have to think and plan, how do we do that? I mean, in the United States, we're starting to turn attention away from it and not really understanding this is a flow of humanity that's not going to stop in our lifetime. We keep closing the door. We keep making it brutal and inhumane. This is a legacy that we're going to leave behind us, and it's going to be a shameful legacy. There is a lot more work to do, and we are just scratching the surface of what's possible. We look to your help and support, whether it's money, whether it's time, and we are forever grateful. Thank you. Very Noble, who is also our board member of Share Humanity, would like to ask some questions. Barry, if you want to come to the front, please, and um, ask the feedback and questions, and then we will be happy to answer your questions. Hello, everyone. Well, what did you think of this film? I think just to piggyback off of what Alex said, heartbreaking. So in that video, you'll see me say, I feel the responsibility to go to Greece and help. Nothing prepares you for that trip and for the stories that you hear. Every single person that we met 
has a story that you can't wrap your head around and you can't imagine. And questions like, oh, do you have any siblings, leads to tears welling up in their eyes. And I, for one, was not prepared for that. And I will say, as heartbreaking as the experience was, what I left with, which I think is probably the most profound thing, is that there is hope. And all it takes is one step in the right direction. This crisis will probably not end anytime soon. We cannot solve it, but we can do something. Whatever we can do within our power has an impact and makes a difference. And that's what I had the opportunity to see happen firsthand. Um, something as simple as inviting somebody to your table for lunch, again, restores that dignity, makes them feel worthy. You have a conversation, you get to forget that you are a refugee, that you might not have a place to sleep that night. And you get to have a conversation and laugh. And something as simple as five euros that buys a soccer ball. And to see how a soccer ball transforms a refugee camp where kids get to play. And again, for one moment in time, they're focused on scoring a goal against the opposing team, not the fact that they don't have the proper shoes. So as heartbreaking as this experience is, um, as complicated and uh, overwhelming it may feel at times, do not let that discourage you from doing whatever you can do within your power because it does make a difference. That moment in time, that smile that you give to somebody, whether you volunteer and come with us on our next trip or volunteer goods or make a donation, it has a profound impact. And that's what I will just say, um, and I hope, I, I guess that was the biggest takeaway for me. With, with that said, if I may say, yes, the stories of these people are heart-wrenching, heartbreaking, because um, I do have the advantage of speaking their languages and understanding their culture. And some of the stories, every time I go to Greece, and this was my fourth time, I cannot sleep the entire night. All I do is, during the day, I'm with them, I'm hugging them, I'm crying at them, I'm laughing with them, but at night, I write about it because some of them have lost their children, their husbands, their um, mothers. And it is just amazing that these people, like you and I, they had beautiful homes, they had comfortable life, everything was going on, either because of wars, or because of economic injustice, or because of um, environmental you know, causes. They are on the move. They have come, and especially the war-torn countries like Afghanistan, like Syria, they have no choice. But, and they have told me, Khala Jan, my dear aunt, do you really think I'd leave a country like Afghanistan, which is my mother's birthplace, my birthplace, it's beautiful, it's amazing. The beauty is one thing, but when there is no job, and when the ISIS are there, and they're cutting your father and mother right in front of you, and you, have, you are in despair, and you have nowhere to go, where do you go? You run away. You take the chance to either die at the GNC or make it to Greece, which we have. They are determined. They are hopeful. And like Sophie said, some of them, the laughs in the hospitality is incredible. They'd be living in a park, they have no place, but they would run and go the minute they see that you speak their language or you understand their culture, or you're there to visit them with some gift for them. They run away, they bring you a cup of coffee from the, the store there, or from, we, we were at uh, Lasvos and one happy family that's run by the Swiss. And it is a beautiful place and we'll talk about that, but they are making a playground. These Afghans, Syrian, they're all making, this was a great, great um, camp. Uh, it was not a camp, it's a setting where the refugees work for refugees by the structure from the Swiss organization called One Happy Family. So when I met the wife of this one Afghan man and I'm talking to her and she introduces me to her husband, in next minute, he brings coffee and tea and cookies. He, was, he had a saw in his hand and he's making the playground. It's incredible how hospitable they are. It's incredible how hopeful they are, how determined they are. 
in, in still, then there are people like you and I, mind you. We co the minute we put that label of refugee, which I do not like, but we, this is what's, word. yeah, we can't find better word, except displaced by, you know, war or environment. So these people still have hopes and they want to get somewhere. And it is just, in, I would love for all of you to come with us, to see it firsthand, to see what they are like in their story, to hear their stories. But if you can't, I always say and think to myself, we can buy one less purse, we can buy one less pair of shoes, we can buy, you know, have a smaller meal, and that $20, that $10, that adds up, that helps these people who, a grandmother who was almost in her 90s, and she was living in Victoria Park, and she cried on my shoulder, and she said, Bibi John, that means dear, um, uh, Bibi is like a, a sign of respect for in my language. Please, take me with you. I'm almost dying. I probably won't make it to America or to anywhere, but right here, it's embarrassing. I've never lived in a park. I don't have anything, you know. People like you guys come and give us food and give us money, but where's my shelter? I grew up in a family, I had a home, I had my grandchildren, but war took everything from me. I'm on the move, but I'm embarrassed to sleep every night in this park. So this is the kind of stories that are really, really heart-wrenching, just like Alexander says. Colin? Jeff has a question. Oh, Jeff has a question. Okay. Jeff, you want to say something? Well, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. That's a great question, and we don't see ourselves as separate from UNICEF. The goal of shared humanity is to rebuild the dignity of people who have been forcibly displaced. That is our mission, and we look to organizations who embody that. UNICEF is one such organization, and they are an amazing organization that actually looks at what people are doing on the ground, the grassroots organizations, and empowers them. So our goal through Shared Humanity is to fundraise here in the United States and identify those organizations that embody rebuilding the dignity of these people that have been forcibly displaced and providing the funds. An example of that, so in addition to UNICEF, which does that and partners with these grassroots organizations, we found an organization called One Happy Family that is on the island of Lesbos. Lesbos is the island that many of you guys have seen in the New York Times where the boats are crashing ashore. It's about four miles from the Turkish border. Thousands have lost their lives in, that, in those treacherous waters. And the people that are lucky enough to make it to shore are locked in Camp Moria. My mom had mentioned Camp Moria is an old prison on the island of Lesbos that is meant to house 2,000 people. To date, there are over 7,000 women, children, and men living within that camp and now sprawling into the olive groves alongside it. In the olive groves, there are no basic services. There are no showers. There are no toilets. There's no health care. People just have these makeshift tents, and they are trapped there with nowhere to go. Then you look at organizations like UNICEF, which about a mile down the road, they have created this beautiful space for women and children, a safe space where the light is flowing in. And all the beauty of Lesbos, this is a beautiful Greek island where the water is green. You get to see that view from, that, from the windows of this community center. And it's this far departure from the camp that they go to at night. Another example, One Happy Family, it's a community center. And when you walk through the gates of that community center, you feel the happiness, you hear the laughter of children, you see the brightly colored walls and guys singing, practicing for their next talent show. And it's again, rebuilding that dignity of uh, these people that have been forcibly displaced. So in short, to answer your question, how does shared humanity partner or what are we doing differently than UNICEF? Don't think of us as adversaries, think of us as partners. We are here to fundraise, to get the word out, to educate, to continue talking about this because this is not changing. This is not going anywhere soon. Our news cycle is short and things get forgotten. And you will hear the Woodhouses and every board member of Shared Humanity saying, people need our help. 
Whatever you can do in your power to help, let's do it. Let's not just check the box and move on. There are innocent people dying, and we are partnering with great organizations like UNICEF, as well as the other organizations that are out there, um, where it's individuals making a huge impact in the lives of others. Good question. Good. Can I we, repeat the question? We do have we do have online, which is you know you go um, mm -hmm. Google sharedhumanityusa.org, and you hit the button. There's a PayPal account. It comes out. It's a nonprofit. It's tax deductible. So whatever you can give, you go share humanity. USA.org. And I think the most important thing is that 100% of all donations goes directly to helping people in need. You look at us, we've been to Greece, well, they have been to Greece now four times. They have paid for those trips out of their pocket. None of the donations that we get go to our travel, go to our food, go to anything that makes us allowed to be there. 100% of it goes to the refugees for emergency relief, as well as these organizations like One Happy Family, where we know that a dollar buys a meal for a person, and 100% of those uh, donations go directly to refugees, whether it's food, clothing. Yes, Alexandra. Can you give some context of what, what was the, the point of this mission, and really what was, what was your, what were the priorities of this? Come on, you go. Come on. The question was, uh, what were our priorities for our fourth mission? How might it be different? I guess, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, um, again, our first trip was just scrambling to help people as best we could. You were there, Alex, and you know what it was like. Rescue it's and rescue and relief up till two or three in the morning, out at five uh, on the coast looking for boats. Uh, it was freezing cold. It was snowing in Greece at that point. It, w it was bad. Um, and so if you could give people warmth and, and food and clothes, and at that time we could give people money, it was 250 euros would get them into Europe. It was a, a tough time, but a ho hopeful time. And it was great to see people come in for a couple of days and then move on. They were out and they were heading north and the uh, Balkan states were cooperating. They had trains, there were uh, terrible trains, but they had them, the, the idea was move them through our country as quick as possible, get them into Germany, get them into Austria, and then that all stopped. So that was the first trip. Uh, I, but also in our second and third trips, we, uh, people were now more in place. The, the border of Macedonia was closed. People piled up to the border, 17, 18,000 people, and then the Greeks came in with big buses and took these folks to basically abandoned industrial buildings, uh, windswept remote plateaus where they, uh, the, the high commissioner tented people as best they could, and those plateaus had scorpions, mosquitoes, bad water, uh, was real, kids had uh, uh, bites all over their body. Uh, so our job at that time was to help feed people. Uh, and we ran from camp to camp with uh, food that the people in the camps could cook. We probably uh, uh, were able to give people food for at least a week, maybe 3,000 people. And so the people were cooking in these uh, camps in uh, over rock, um, basically a campfire with a, a, t a former um, olive oil can. That was their soup can. And so it was bad, it was rough, and again, the, the institutions were not prepared. We went back again uh, to really to do more of the same, and we found that people were now starting to live in accommodations in Athens. We spent most of our time in, in Athens where uh, the, the High Commissioner was giving stipends to people to get rental buildings, pile in, you know, big families, multifamily places. Uh, and we helped uh, one group of five families. We a insisted that there be a Kurdish family, an, an uh, Arabic family, an Afghan family, and, and, and an Iraqi family, that they all share that facility, and we were able to give enough rent to accommodate uh, three months. 
And then that facility, when we went back the last time, was still in operation. So we provided seed money to make that happen. Our last trip, we said, now we have a pretty good sense. We still don't have a partner that we can really link up with. We can't spend all our time there. We've got to find people doing the right thing in the right way. And uh, so our job really was to go back and assess and do an assessment of what are your values, your mission, uh, what are your financial needs, who's your clientele, how do you resolve conflicts, ask a, a whole slew of questions so that we could feel comfortable. And it was really gratifying that finally we found, we thought, at least three or four organizations that are doing the right thing for the right reasons, and uh, we could feel comfortable now saying, if we can raise money, we're going to send it to you. We're going to do it to, for particular projects, maybe. Maybe it's a project for another safe place or a project for a vocational facility where people can learn or bring their skills forward and get ready for employment. Um, and also, there's a, a number of different things we can do. Uh, legal assistance, child uh, building more child-friendly places. UNICEF will tell you there are 3,000 unaccompanied children, young children, without their parents in Greece. They have facilities and accommodations only for 1,000. So they're, even the big institutions are overwhelmed. They need money. They need resources. And again, it's a problem uh, right now where people are trying to form communities and, and uh, makeshift operations, makeshift facilities. And if we can give some kind of uh, uh, support in that regard, it would be beneficial. One last comment. Um, now, because people are in different hot hotels and areas called squats, which are abandoned hotels that they basically take over, and also accommodations provided by the High Commissioner, the population is getting scattered through Athens, and the, uh, people can get lost, and they can despair in, their, in the privacy, if you will, of their 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 home and they can't get out they don't know where the communities are so community centers are becoming more and more important to bring services back to these people and then send them the send the people out to here go with this place for uh, you need food you need diapers go here you need legal assistance go here uh, there's a network developing now of services that are now provided to the scattered population if I may say, out, the purpose of this fourth trip was two-prong. One was that we were to, relief and rescue still continues, and we uh, were giving some donors money that specifically give it to the people who are living in parks, who have no homes, the young people who are on drugs, but there's a lot of problems there. The young men, um, especially men, but there are women too, 15 to 18 years old, these are called underage uh, minors, um, and these are the ones that are in deep trouble because what's happening, there's a lot of sexual assaults and there's drugs problem. They live in the park, they do uh, heroin, cocaine, and everything, and we met a lot of them. So we were there to give and distribute that money that was given to us. Um, that was one thing. And I also met a young man, uh, which we do have it in the film later, maybe on um, at the GA session. Uh, there are men and women running from Iran who are, have changed their sex. This young man told me he was a girl until 15. And when he changed his sex to be now this young, good-looking boy, our man, the, the, the country, the community, everybody, his own parents turned around him, and they were after him to kill him. So he had to escape, but when we met him, he was living in the park, in Victoria Park. His name was Reza, and we have had interview with him, and we have given him help. So there are a lot of cases like that. That was one purpose. The other purpose was to assess, just like Colin said, the different programs and different partners. There's 150 nonprofits from Europe in the United States of America, small nonprofits that are working there hand to hand, face to face with people. And from that, we assess about 10 of them. And from the 10, we have two 
at the top of our list, and then there's a third one also that we would like to raise funds for in the United States of America and create a partnership. One was Scrap Co-op, which they are making tra uh, um, uh, they make trash to treasure, meaning the Greek has a lot of uh, recycling problem and lots of garbage. Um, and the garbage is everywhere. So these young men, refugees, and women, they go around, they take these pieces, and they turn it to tables, to chairs, to, and we were instrumental in helping them, giving them the money, and we will support them further. It's called Scrap Co-op. And then the other one was ANCA. ANCA is at Luxembourg, Australia, and Ireland got together and formed this um, magnificent group where they want to give purpose to the refugees, where the refugees could um, learn English, learn Greek, um, but also do a lot of Elec um, be electrician, be, uh, they are in their home countries, but right now they don't have jobs. So this will give them the opportunity to have workshops, to have students, to learn more, to make the products and then sell it to IRC, to UNICEF, to other bigger organizations. And then there's another one happy family run by the Swiss. My oh my, the most organized, amazing, I would love to anybody to, to live there, they had a bank with fake money. They give the refugees who come from Camp Moria three tickets, one for coffee, tea, or hookah. Talk about freedom in, in normalcy. If you want to smoke, it's your choice. Here's a ticket. If you want to have hot chocolate, if you want to have coffee, they have a beautiful built Swiss-like cafe for them. Then they give another ticket for lunch. There is vegetarian lunch, there's vegan lunch, and then there is um, meat lunch, chicken or you know beef or lamb. And then they have a space for women to just socialize, women to women, where they could have the space. In right there next to it is a daycare type of center. So when they have little children, the little children all run by refugee, for refugee, only the structure in the umbrella comes from Switzerland. How wonderful and how amazing. And just like Sophie said, you hear the laughs. Organic gardens, um, karate classes for the Afghan little children by the other Afghan or Syrian. It was incredible. It was something that we definitely support. We did give them a lot of money at that time. We will give them more money. We want to count on all of you to make a difference in the lives of the refugees. Yeah. So these. I, I just want to qualify one thing, though. Um, again, going back to unaccompanied young men in Athens, I don't want you to feel that we gave money to uh, for drugs. people that were uh, on drugs. We didn't. Oh, yeah. But we certainly gave money to these young guys who are at risk of saying that, you know, there's, how am I going to live? Uh, there is a very severe situation of prostitution that's being used and abused by the Greeks. And there is a very, very... Visitors, too. Visitors. There's an international, right? Sophie's correct about that. Come and, you know, it's just shameful. But there is one park that we didn't spend time in. Sophie and I were about to go into it, and it was incredibly dangerous. It looked like... Uh, it, was, it seemed larger than Central Park. It was all wooded and outflowed. The, as, as the sun set, outflowed hundreds of young men. And that's where people go to abuse and, and use these younger people for sex. Yeah, and so the younger people we met, we met some in a, a house that had been brought in and saved, if you will, um, from the streets by uh, this, a Spanish group. And we, they weren't being paid, so we did what we could to give a little bit of pocket money so that they could have agency and they could go buy things that they needed. So uh, just want to clarify that. So, uh, there's a question. Well, you know, I, I just read this. I read, uh, the question was, is there any information? I guess if, you, if you're talking, Ruth, about the, the larger problem, I read the UNICEF stuff, and it is terrific. It gives you a sense of the systematic problem occurring in Greece and the stories of people who 
will share their stories with you about uh, traveling from uh, from Iran into Turkey and being fired upon by the 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 military and the border guards and losing members of their family. There's a whole slew of stories. We ourselves, we don't have time we to be, do that. No, we, we hope to. We will be doing it. We will be doing it. Miriam Salaski, oh, one yeah. of our board member, is. Uh, trying to get the stories. I have all the stories. I have written it, but it will be published. And I love your question, and it is valid. We will distribute it and deliver it to all of you. It is complicated. That's true. The thing is, though, the, the reality is this is a very complicated situation. And there is no clean cut A to B to C. I will say there is a ton of information online. We do have a website as well as our Facebook page that houses all the stories, all of the things that we've done that recaps our experience day to day, every day that we're there. Yes. So it's push and pull factors. Everybody has a different story, and it's beyond just Syria. For Syria, it's primarily the civil war with Afghanistan. It is the return of the Taliban and Daesh and ISIS. Um, for countries like Iran, there are all of these issues with who are second-class citizens, that they're being forced to be martyrs, that they're being forced to die on the front lines for the Iran in the Syria war. There are a million stories that we could share with you. In Egypt, it's economic. I mean, not economic, political. In Morocco, it's political. There are all these different factors at play, and it's a very complicated situation. But that said, though, this is what I will say. I had mentioned before, it is overwhelming. We will not solve it any day and in the near future, but we can do something, a small step, to make a difference in the lives of people, just like you and I. Take one thing at a time. You could help one person at a time. One Put one, five dollars in the bucket, and it will have a ripple effect in the life of this person. I got a call two nights ago, in the middle of the night I get calls, from the woman who had given birth to a baby in the park. And she is from Kandahar, where I am from, and we gave her some money and we found her a place, but now she d doesn't have that place anymore because something happened with that basement, it fell through, and she called me, she says, my baby is gonna die, the baby is two months old now. Can you send me some more money? Can you send I would love to, but again, we also have responsibility. That's why we need to fundraise. We need to count on all of you. If all of you can pull together and pull your financial support together, we can make a difference. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I have a question, Bob. Bob, you have a question? Oh, that's a good question. Let me just jump in on that, Bob. I'll give you a real, a real case. Um, we went to visit Praxis, who also is a grantee from our congregation, from and they, they're a, a um, Greek organization, and they're the foremost human rights, social justice organization in Greece, and were vetted by our UU service committee. We went to visit them at that drop-in center that you saw in the movie, and the woman told us, well, it used to be that we could get money, uh, the NGOs and organizations such as us could get money directly from the EU. The Greek government stopped that, and it has to go through the Greek government, and we've not paid our rent for five months because they're holding back on that money to balance their budget, to uh, pay the IMF, I guess, and they've delayed uh, basically what should be going to humanitarian organizations for their own economic purpose. Um, you know, so it, it, that's a real example. Uh, for, uh, from the case of a refugee, it's, it's very tough to work. If, so and working is so important. Like, so that is a real problem, and that's why I'll, most refugees say, you know, I may like it here, the people are nice, but I'm not going to be able to live here. I've got to get out and get a job. So some of these groups, ones that we like, are trying to 
basically build an entrepreneurial response, like Latifa mentioned recycling. There's one, we talked to one Egyptian young man, he's a chemist by profession, and got caught up in the, uh, this, the uprising and was put in jail. And I asked him, well, what would you want to do in Greece? And he said, the Greece, Greeks don't recycle. We could, real, we could cut up their plastic. We could make uh, textiles out of it. We just need the machinery. We could do some really good work here. So that might be a small example, but uh, you're not going to get hired by a Greek you're gonna, uh, because their uh, jobs are minimal. And frankly, if you do, you're probably going to be abused to some degree. You're not going to get a fair wage. One interesting thing that the volunteer groups are doing, they're paying a fair wage to any Greek or refugee that works for them, which is 400 euros a month. That's about 600 US dollars is the average Greek salary. So it's very, very tough. Uh, but just Final, uh, the Greeks have said that they had a GPD growth of about 1.6% in the last quarter. So maybe they're c coming out of it, but a lot of the younger people have left. They've gone to Europe if they can, or uh, other EU states. There's a brain drain. The kids are, are going out as, as quick as they ca possibly can. One complicating factor, if you're a refugee and finally get your green card, if you will, or the, you, your status, you can leave Greece for, on a periodic basis. And uh, so they're probably going to be leaving uh, some of these uh, highly qualified refugees, engineers, chemists, uh, professors, they're going to they're going to they're going to walk if they can. I mean, with that, we met so many amazing um, professors and engineers and chemists. It is, you know, if you look at Syrian, they are way and the Greek says it, the, the Greek teachers told me they're way above their educational system or their understanding of everything is way above the Greeks. But then there are Afghans who are very well educated and they're telling me we cannot stay here because we don't have jobs. We don't have any purpose. It is enough. So what are the what are they doing now? They have found another way. When push comes to shove, as you know, the EU closes its doors. Now, all the people who are imprisoned in Greece have found ways to send either their son or their daughter, the younger one, with a smuggler to Germany, to Austria, to uh, France, to where, and then with a fake passport. And then the passport is torn, and of course, people like uh, it becomes, you know, UNICEF is, will talk about that, or Colin could give you information. In the government of that country, you know, if it's in Germany or Austria, they pick up these kids from the streets, and then they say, well, where? And then the parents connect with them and said, I'm here, I'm coming. So that's called the reunification plan that most of the refugees are now into, and they are trying to get out that way from Greece. So, Bob, to your point, Greece is getting a ton of money and it's not going to the refugees, which is why it's so important to support organizations that are on the ground doing great work, just as UNICEF does. So I'd love to invite Emma up to speak a little bit more about UNICEF's work in Greece and the amazing work that they're doing. And I'll let her. Well, Emma is the director of the UNICEF program that connected us with um, those wonderful officers in Athens. First of all, before I even go to that, Emma invited us um, to a get together in Manhattan where we met, you know, all the people and they, it was like a thank you, Shelter Rock kind of uh, get together. They thanked all their donors. You, you all know UNICEF, the great work they do. But then Emma also connected us. Otherwise, without Emma, we wouldn't be able to meet these big officials in Athens or in Lesbos. So I thank Emma for that. And Emma, thank you for coming, my thank dear. You. And it's so nice to see you, to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here and to, to speak with all of you. Um, what are funds doing to help save a child from getting into the hands of smugglers? What is it doing to put food on the table for that child? What is it helping? Um, to do for a mother who is pregnant and needs to nurse her child in her womb. 
What is it that, what are those funds and what am I doing tomorrow to help that child in a month and in a year, making sure that they have access to school and access to education? And then what am I helping that child for the future as they become an adult and as they become a leader in their own countries, as they become a father and a mother? And I think when I, contextualize it in those terms, I think it really helps identify the impact that UNICEF is having as well as shared humanity. Because they e together they equal out the full holistic impact that we, we can do and what we are making on this crisis that's happening right now. And I think the beauty that's happened here is um, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Shelter Rock is focused in on a very specific area of the world and in this crisis. And you are making not only an impact at the national scale with your support to UNICEF, we're working with the government, we're pushing for policies to change so that children can be integrated into society, so that children are protected on the large scale um, systems of child protection. But then we're also working with organizations that are local and impacting that daily life. And that's what you guys are doing. That is what is represented at this table right now that you have impacted is both the holistic scale of one country and what they're fighting to change, as well as down to the family and the child. So thank you for all that you have done to help empower that. And I also do have information with me on um, the grant that we received and the impact that has been made over the past year and the incredible numbers of children that have been impacted by that. Yeah, I want to jump in on that. Thank you, Em. Um, people told us, uh, UNICEF and, and others, we have a holistic approach. What does that child need? What can we provide? And they start with the individual, and from that, policies are built out, and programs are built out. And that's what I really like, is that they try to find out what are the needs, and then work from that point of view. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. I want to thank you all for attending. I think it, we're... That ship has sailed. I, you know, All right, we're going to try to bring in Artemis Joukowsky, the director of our little movie, and also director of um, the, the Sharps War, Defying the Nazis. You know, and Ruth, getting back while we're waiting, uh, yeah, it can seem overwhelming if you see it as a big picture. But if you just look at the faces of people, you touch them, you hold them, you reach your hand out in friendship, you feed them, you will come away feeling like, hey, I made a difference and I feel so much better for myself. And, and, and I think that's all we can do. If these folks who, who are profiled in Artemis Joukowsky's PBS movie, if, if, if they said, uh, it's too big for me, I can't do it, then uh, 2,500 Jews would not have been saved. And when um, Ken Burns talked about that movie in interviews prior to the showing of that movie, he said, just think, uh, when I see these people that were saved, and we got to meet some of the child uh, refugees that were saved, and they were professors, they were artists, they were poets. And Ken Burns said, just when I see these people and I think of the human possibility that these people represent and how successful they've been, and when I look and I turn to the darkness and see that six million people were killed, what did that do to humanity? How much did we lose as a, as a, a human race by slaughtering and killing so many people? And I would say the same is occurring right now when we've seen what's happened in Syria, an absolute devastation of society, of good, solid, middle-class people who only wanted their say in their government. They only wanted what we take as a, as a norm, uh, the right to say, to talk to those who govern them, to say how we want to live. Uh, it's, remember, Syria was a peaceful res revolution that once the, uh, the Syrians' military started to shoot down children in the street who were demonstrating nobody was armed, then it began to be an armed resistance. 
and also in Afghanistan. Afghanistan, I looked at the UNICEF numbers. The Afghans have the greatest experience of violence on the trail, on the refugee trail. 70% of all Afghans say they have experienced violence. So uh, you, you've got even a, uh, you know, tough things happening and discrimination happening in, on, the, on the refugee trail. And there are refugees that are highly discriminated against. Uh, I would cite the African refugees. Uh, and they're, you know, they're coming from the South uh, South um, Sudan and uh, those areas and losing their lives in the, uh, in the desert Eritrea. Uh, and, and Eritrea. We, I mean, uh, one thing I will say, when we first went, I was sh shocked to see an, an, a Nigerian and Somali in the refugee camps. When we went back, absolutely not. They were a, a big part of the population. And there's a real change there in, in the clientele. Alex. Good question. Latifa? Okay. How did our UU values inspire us to do this work? Well, first of all, before the UU values, I am a daughter of refugee, and my parents came as refugee. And Colin and I, thanks to Colin and thanks to the United States of America, we brought about 15 members of my family during the Russian war of Afghanistan when the Russian took over. They executed two of my uncles and they were after my father who was the mayor of Zabal at the time. So he escaped with his, alone first with my brother and then after that my um, 14 more members of my family all came as refugee through the State Department agent that was sent to Pakistan to interview them and brought them. So I have firsthand touched by what it is like to be a refugee's daughter or to be a refugee through their stories. Second, my uh, UU values, since we've been a member almost 24 years of this wonderful congregation and we aspire to be justice-seeking people and that justice to in, 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 in all walks of our life, we see how this congregation is doing all the great work. And of course, being a member of this congregation and being involved with that great work inspired me. And specifically, to be honest with you, I was a regional coordinator for UUSC for eight years, Colin and I both. And the movie that we saw at that time when Charlie Clement was the president of the UUSC, it was called The Hero of the Spirits, which is today called the, not the two who did, today it's called Righteous Among Us, uh, The Sharps War Defying the Nazis. So that same movie, when I saw, I called the Reverend Ned White, who was the executive director of each at the time, and I said, there's an incredible movie. Our um, minister, Waste of Sharp, went and saved so many lives in his wife and left their two little children. And can we show that to the entire community of Long Island? And through his leadership and his support, eventually, after five years, then we were able to bring it to our congregation and bring Artemis here and show that movie. And then we worked on the large grant, and through large grant, the movie became so well known once Ken Burns got involved that it made it all the way to the White House. So I was inspired by that movie, and that is my UU values, that the UUs have done amazing things. And I'm walking, basically, Colin and I, in the shoes of the Sharps. We are nowhere near Sharps, but we're walking in their shoes. And there are great UUs who have done amazing things in this religion and with the values of UUs. So I'm very, very happy to be a member of the UU religion. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. Thank you, Barry. Oh, oh yeah. to right. answer Alex's oh, yeah, question. Yeah, no, oh, we are going to. Yeah. To answer, answer Alex's question about how my Unitarian Universalist values have led me on this journey, it starts with 
As Unitarian Universalists, we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every single person and that we are all connected. And while it's easy to turn our back and say, hey, that's happening in Syria, that's happening in Afghanistan, it doesn't impact my day to day, it is so important to understand that these are human beings just like you and I. This could one day happen to each and every one of us, and who will help us? So we have to take a stand. We have to do whatever we can within our power to make a difference, because we are all human beings, and we are all connected. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'll, I'll just close up. Um, if you look at our site, you'll say, wow, we, we started with our beliefs. And I stole a lot of beliefs from the Unitarian Universalist uh, principles. And one of the beliefs is the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Um, and I also added that um, we recognize that the choices we make, the actions we take, or the actions we don't take, can have a lasting impact, not only on the people that we hope to serve, but also on ourselves. So I am just, uh, maybe I'm a little bit of a moralist, but I, I don't want I wouldn't want my children's children to say, uh, what did your grandparents do during the great refugee crisis? Oh, uh, they didn't, well, you know, they didn't know what was going on. They, uh, they didn't do anything. Um, I just fe feel that we can do something. And also because we have an international family and we, ha we have seen the face of the other and they look very much like us. And so, um, you know, I urge you to come to our site and, and see. So we start with our beliefs and then our mission and, and our goals and objectives. So thank you very much, everybody, for attending. It was really nice of you to stay. And I, I want to just say we're motivated by each and every one of you, by your interest, by your commitment, and the, sh and the conversations we have in the hallways and uh, other places. It inspires us because we we see good people with values that we want to aspire to, to live. And so we reinforce each other to do the right thing and then do it well. Thank you very much. And to top it off, love conquers everything. True love, love for each other, love for your community, love for your society. Love is the word everywhere. If we love each other, and we get, reach out to each other, we could have a beautiful community, beautiful congregation, beautiful society. Thank you all, but one qu thing, I would love for all of you, the Share Humanity members of the board, with your t-shirts, Jeff, don't take the t-shirt off, <laughs> t-shirts here for the camera, please everybody come and come up board with members. your t-shirts. And, and Reverend Ned White is going to repeat his, uh, okay. Come on. Okay. The people also, we have, we have a, a person who is, would need a ride to Glen Cove. If anybody has an opportunity to drive someone to Glen Cove, just come and see me after the presentation. It would be great. Thank you.